Yeehaw! We're back with an all new episode of Keep It. I'm Cowboy Madison. I'm Rootin' Tootin' Grand Slam Breakfast Louis Vertel. <laughs> and we're not alone this time at the Hoot Nanny. We have a third <laughs> cast member today, uh, Crooked Media's esteemed authoress, a, an amazing author, by the way, Thank but also you. maybe a more amazing podcaster. The fabulous Kendra James. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited. I have been two step in for this three day weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am excited too. I've, I've, I, I really like this album. Um, I have some thoughts. We'll get into all of it. Obviously, this is the Cowboy Carter episode. Uh, I was already harangued on social media that this episode had better just be about the album to be fair i don't else. even know what else would be nothing offered else up. happened yeah this was pop culture this weekend <laughs> jojo see was rebrand i did see that <laughs> that did get into my algorithm it won't be her last <laughs> yeah she was at the iheart awards last night with beyonce who honestly this is such a fun era to me i mean a lot of people have compared it to i am sasha fierce uh just because you know First of all, it's a sprawling album. It's long as hell. Uh, it is 27 tracks. It is about 79 minutes. And it it feels long in the same way that I Am Sasha Fierce was a very long double disc. Um, and it's also a very accessible throwback era for her. Like, she popped up at the I Heart Awards uh, last night to get the Innovator Award from Stevie Wonder, where she revealed that he was playing the harmonica on Jolene and how many secret re fucking reveals can this album it's, have that's been <laughs> I have no criticisms really for this album aside from the fact that I have been sitting around having to guess where I'm thinking I'm hearing people because there are not full credits out right there are partial credits on title but it doesn't have like who's playing what and that's what I, I want to give these people their flowers but right. we'll get into it <laughs> but, but but it's like give these people it's like thousands and thousands of people right. like you, like it's it's longer than any Beyonce Vogue rap could possibly entail <laughs> 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 I think also there's first of all there's a big issue with the album where the the vinyls were pressed uh weeks ago and now the vinyls have arrived and does not have Yaya on it um the Linda Martell show it does not have flamenco which is perfectly fine uh and it doesn't have a Louisiana on it and this is a problem that has popped up in vinyls recently. You know, Nicki Minaj had her album um, pressed on vinyl and it was missing several tracks. And then Ariana Grande's Eternal Sunshine was also missing vocals on the song Supernatural. So this, this is a problem that is popping up lately, uh, mostly because people are printing the vinyls earlier than the album is being available on digital. And it's very evident that these artists, particularly Beyonce, have been working on the album until the last possible minute, which is kind of unusual for her, I feel like. Uh, but a lot of people mentioned that they were laying down vocals or they were mixing things for this album up to like a week before it was released. So she was tinkering with the final project of Act Two um, right before it was supposed to come out. Even the albums, even the vinyls and the CD have the original title. Beyonce yeah. on it. Um, it does not say Cowboy Carter anywhere except for a sticker, which is put onto the vinyls and the CD. And people are really upset about this. I've been spending a lot of time in the subreddit <laughs> this weekend. They're pressed. They're really upset. Like a vinyl. <laughs> yeah, much like. Um, and for me, I kind of like, I get it. You're upset. You wanted your full thing. But if you read the website description, there was no track list when we ordered this thing. There was no promise of a bonus poster. There was no promise of anything aside from you're getting some sort of vinyl pressing. And so I'm not I'm not super upset. This feels so close to a misprint um, just due to the packaging also being wrong, which says to me that I'm just like, well, I'm going to buy the the real one, the, the real one when it comes out. And I'm going to not take the, the plastic off of this, and it's going to be worth some money in four years. Yeah, it's like having the postage stamp with the upside-down airplane on exactly. it or whatever. It's like, well, one day I'll, I'll put this on whatever super post-apocalyptic eBay is and then make a trillion dollars. Yeah. They made a 911 stamp. <laughs> oh, that's your joke on that? Okay. <laughs> Enjoy Comedy Central in 2003. <laughs> 
get me on midnight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I feel like it's it's very funny that this is being taken this way because it almost feels in a way like, not to invoke his name, I'm so sorry, but Kanye-esque, if you recall, particularly The Life of Pablo, mm -hmm. where people kept making jokes where it kept changing and then adding and taking things away from the streaming version. Beyonce at least hasn't done that. The album is out. And she's not tinkering with the streaming version. Um, and honestly, I feel like maybe she even just announced the album date and was like, this is going to make me stop working on it. <laughs> <laughs> because it was supposed to be, we know that she's this perfectionist Virgo. Uh, we've, we've seen too many documentaries where she is down to the right light bulb. This needs to be perfect. And we also know that from interviews that this was supposed to be act one right. mm -hmm. originally. Um, so we can talk about that now. It was originally supposed to be act one. She recorded all of these um, projects, started them during COVID, um, like 2020-ish, 2019. And she was originally going to release this as act one, but after the pandemic, she decided that people, you know, really needed to dance, you know, they needed to, Boogie on down to the discotheque. And that's why and we got CVS. Renaissance. That's right. yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why we got re Renaissance first. And honestly, good for her. Because if this album had been released first, I do not know how well it would have been received. I, especially as the beginning of like a trilogy. Like if we thought this was the first mm -hmm. chapter. Because I feel like this is a good... Inter you know what it's like back to the future part three. Oh, we'll take a stop at the old west but it's not the whole story you know <laughs> <laughs> and it definitely is her leading into i guess perceptions of her perceptions of what we thought this album was going to be it kept we kept saying this is the country album this is the country album and she sort of helped along with that by releasing texas hold'em by releasing uh, 16 Carriages, having them labeled S Country on iTunes. And then she was like, well, it's not a country album. It's a Beyonce album. And now listening to it, I would more classify this album as a Western, not country. I've been calling it Americana in mm. my head, just like overall Americana. And I will say this era of hers, of these acts, it does seem to be the era where we're just going to release the singles that tell you absolutely nothing about what the album is actually going to sound like. Right. No, it's I, I would compare it to Taylor Swift in that way when, mm -hmm. you know, Shake It Off comes out and then the rest of the album is a completely sonically uh, different situation. Yeah. I might also add the word outlaw to how I would describe it mm -hmm. because mm. um, it, it's more like, yeah, there's like a cinematic Western atmosphere to the album, but there's not much, like nothing sounds, for example, like, and I'm not saying anybody thought the album would sound like this, Shania Twain. Like everything is <laughs> mm -hmm. more like, folk and vintage with then newer styles introduced kind of alongside the peck and paw atmosphere of the album yeah and it's overall also like this is her most violent album mm. i would say which i find to be very interesting she is she's killing people yeah. she's psychotic yes. <laughs> <laughs> daughter is a deranged song <laughs> But we're getting ahead of ourselves because this is just the this is just the intro. This is just our um, keep it requiem. Yes, right. okay. if you will. Uh, yes. <laughs> Nothing really ends. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, it is. It's exciting to have Kendra here. We're gonna get into the full album. Uh, we also have uh, Justice Smith here this week. An amazing actor. I love him. Very psyched so, to have Justice Smith. Yes, and. Um, it is it is also very weird to be sitting here I'm back in New York recording this because I was truly just in LA for the last one and then I did a bunch of segments and videos with Kendra uh and then I came back to New York and then I saw Lewis in New York. Yes, uh, we were at uh, Horse Meat Disco which is just a colossal apocalyptic gayscape where <laughs> you just if you walk in and you're immediately like like there's sweat on you like laminate immediately. <laughs> um, but I was having a wonderful time and, you know, making friends, if you will. That what we're calling it. Yeah. Super <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sounds like how they would uh, report it on it in the police blotter in the 70s. A bunch of gays were out making friends <laughs> last night. Where was your family? <laughs> yeah. You know, I will say not not to not to get into the horse beat of it all, but it's at the knockdown center and 
I love the knockdown center, Big but there needs place, to be yeah. some. I mean, there needs to be something done about the float in that place. There is a specific the specific part but on the right side. It is giving fire hazard. It uh, uh, you know what it reminds me of in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when they there's the underground skate park and arcade zone where you can go, but it's also like caked with smoke because in those days people just smoked inside. Um, but anyway, it just has that weird, where am I atmosphere? How is there this much room in this city, et cetera? How are y'all both doing? I can't do this anymore. I have not <laughs> seen the sunrise in Hell's Kitchen since I was like 24. I was fully home by three. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, okay. I, I have a scene. I cannot do sleep deprivation. <laughs> and by the way, also before I begin, I just want to say, mysteriously yesterday, I was in a terrible car accident. I was T-bone driving home. <gasps> I am completely fine. I am not injured at all. The other driver's fine, whatever. But I just want to say, was it Cowboy Carter? That's right. I, 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 <laughs> I was banging Desert seat. Eagle too hard, and you know me, I flipped right over the hood. Um, no, but I want to say I was discombobulated afterwards. It was a crazy feeling. You don't know what to do. You, you're wondering if you're okay. And I just want to say that headspace is exactly right for beginning Traders Australia season two, which is only for people who have recently been concussed. Oh my is it god, on yet? they are the zaniest cast I have ever seen. It is immediately laughable and only gets crazier. So I'm just saying, if you're, you know, if you if you've suffered some, uh, you know, kind of debilitating moment, all hope is not lost for you. You're ready for reality TV. Did they add season two of Australia to Peacock? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, because I, I was waiting for. I hate using a VPN to be honest, and I have only I only use it to watch Survivor Australia. But um, I've been getting people into season two of UK because that's been on peak, which is for fabulous. A few weeks. Do I need yes. to watch these normies? Um, yes, the normies I think are generally speaking better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The the international versions teach you that. The, okay. The in the domestic version, it's not as true. If you think that this is like Beyonce's most violent album. Traitors season two, UK. You would think the traitors are actually murdering people, <laughs> right? The way that this cast is acting. They're literally. There's one yes. traitor who is truly psychotic. The, and also, by the way, again, it's just a, a role in a game you are assigned. There's nothing actually, quote unquote, psychotic about what's happening. And the way people get into character is frightening. You They're know, just internalized. Yes, right. Yeah, the Pedro Parks method. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> and, precisely. <laughs> and honestly, the way that people who are faithfuls talk about morality in the game of traitors. As if it could have been you who was tapped and become come a traitor right, at the right. beginning of the game. No, they truly think of themselves as victims as opposed to game show contestants. <laughs> okay, I'm very excited that Australia season two um, is on Peacock, so I will be watching that. I also want to do a quick shout out to Deal or No Deal Island. Oh Jesus what? Christ! Which I am watching, and the I devil am pitched that himself. With. I can picture him running right up to Mark Burnett. <laughs> Deal or No Deal Island, for the girls who are familiar with Deal or No Deal, obviously, you know, there's the banker, there's the um, there's the ladies with the briefcases, and you're, you're basically just picking random briefcases and seeing how much money is in them, and then the banker will make you a deal, and you have to guess if he's bluffing you or if there's more or less in your suitcase. Deal or No Deal Island is like Survivor meets Deal or no deal, everyone is living on this island and they compete in challenges. And then the person who gets the highest amount in a briefcase is immune. And then they decide between the two people who have the lowest amount who is going to play the banker's game. Mm. And when that person wins, they get to select whoever they want to be eliminated, except for the immune person. But if they lose, they have to leave the island. And I was immediately drawn in because Boston Rob is on this show. Oh, I didn't realize they were working Wait, so with a familiar a pool. Oh, yeah. yeah, I did not know that. Yes, Boston Rob. Well, it's all random new people except for Boston Rob and Claudia Jordan. What? Excuse me? Yes, Toes herself? Claudia Jordan. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> she is on it and she keeps, her whole thing is she's talking about how um, she has experience playing this because she used to be one of the Deal or No Deal briefcase models. Right, right. Oh, excuse me, which is like, <laughs> you're Vanna White, basically? That is unbelievable. It's like, it's you like don't even Vanna, know what's it's in like the briefcase White. when you're holding it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like Vanna White coming to Wheel of Fortune and saying, 
I know this game like the back of my yeah. hand. How did JoJo Siwa's <laughs> rebrand get across my algorithm and Claudia Jordan living on an island didn't? I, Something's very I have off. no yeah. idea. But I think I think I'm like officially peacock high. I guess oh, so. Yeah, okay. I love From peacock. the traders. Oh, excuse me. When I ran yeah. out of traders, I literally started watching old Project Runway episodes so that I could stick around Peacock in case more traders happened. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to be nearby. Just wanted to make sure the app worked. Yeah. <laughs> I watch uh, I, since since Days of Our Lives moved to Peacock and left NBC. I obviously watch it every day. Um, I think we need some sort of soap opera traders, to be honest, or mix some of them in there. Yeah, why not? I can see Eileen you know? Davidson popping over. It, oh, I would love Eileen Davidson on traders because if you think Housewives are being over the top, give us some soap actors on the traders um, auditioning to get back on whatever show that they've been cut. From. Well, by the way, once upon <laughs> a time, you could count on Big Brother cast members at least one per season getting like a a quick role on The Bold and the Beautiful or something, and I love that trashy pipeline just i think that's kind of where they belong so let's keep that going i am firmly pro dealer no deal island but i do want to let you know that like the the normal people on there are truly like midwest yokels mm. my people it's, it's, oh you're saying representation <laughs> yeah. matters okay very good <laughs> all right so when we are back we are going to dive into cowboy carter track by track uh just how you want it Okay, so this album starts out with a song, American Requiem. And because it's act two, uh, all of the song titles with an I have a double I right. in them, which is, which is part of the act two-ness of it all. But I also feel like it's part of her um, drawl if you choose to pronounce it that way i also think oh. she just wants us fighting with autocorrect all weekend excuse me the battles i have waged against my phone for this woman <laughs> just to explain my feeling about a song <laughs> when you're typing the song titles to people kendra do you add the extra i have been because that's the way she wanted it and right. i'm and so i respect that i stopped well <laughs> I stopped. <laughs> All right. Well, someone's not high. <laughs> and with Riverdance, it's just it's just two words. Okay. My my uh, my iPhone does not need to know the four word River Riverdance. Okay. I'm not invoking Michael Flatley. We'll get to yeah. that. <laughs> but American Requiem is how we open up the album, and we know that Beyonce loves. She loves an intro. She loves an overture. This is very "Pray You Catch Me" from Lemonade. It's highly dramatic. It's soft. Yeah, it's dramatic and it's solemn. And then it gets into, I guess, the theme of the album. It discusses the CMA's incident um, and how she was really sort of angered and propelled into making this project. I mean, I saw this track. First of all, I think it's her best opening track mm. on any of the eight albums, hands down. And I saw it really as this is a thesis statement, because as as you're saying, it doesn't name the CMA's, which, by the way, have we had proof of life? from the CMAs since this dropped. Yeah, right. I have not seen a peep. I have not heard from anyone. They, like, are they cowering? Where are they? And but, we, we are, we're not their core demo, to be sure. So right, it's possible we don't know. I've been, cl I've been <laughs> click clacking around. I've been yeah, looking. Okay. Um, but Has anyone checked the clan rally? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what are they bumping? Right. Um, no, but yeah, it's the clearest, uh, it's the clearest thesis that she has ever laid out about an album. And it really tells you from the lyrics to the style of music that it goes through throughout the song, it tells you exactly what you're getting from this album. You're hearing sort of that 70s guitar. You're hearing a lot of Beatles influence, I felt like, which you're getting obviously straight into the next track, but then also in other places throughout the album. Um, I It's rare that a first song is like one of my favorites, but I the more I have thought about it this weekend... American Requiem like firmly slots into at least my top five, I think, on this album. And in fact, if that song weren't mm. there, the album would suffer because there's yes. so many directions on this album that you almost need like a compass at the beginning mm -hmm. to tell you, well, it's going to go all these different places. In fact, I would say the most surprising thing about this album is because country, you know, as I experienced that country feels like one particular thing, the amount of influences that are not country are very surprising. Mm -hmm. You know, just like like I would never expect to hear the Beatles in any form on this album. And yet it's like, oh, I guess picking Blackbird has country in it or whatever. Like the moment in Yaya -Ya with uh, Good Vibrations by the Beach Boys. It's like, who knew she cared? You know, it's <laughs> like it's very interesting, like what she I mean, because obviously she's performing to the nth on this. The vocals are so uh, masterfully done. Some this of her best vocal, vocals ever. Vocal album. But at the same time, it's like, 
just like on Renaissance, she is moving between so many roles. It's like it is didactic. She's literally stepping aside from being a star to be like, these other things have mattered before me. They will matter after me. And I'm going to work with them and and also do my own thing. So there's just a lot of um, explaining and strategizing as well as simply being Beyonce on the album. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of homework with the album uh, yes which i would say that, is... well let me let me say something about exactly that word which is sometimes it feels like oh she did the homework and then occasionally it feels like homework <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean i i feel i felt very much like that episode of fresh prince of bel-air um where will and carlton are the two black kids in aunt viv's uh, African American studies class, <laughs> uh, and she reprimands them for not working as hard as the white students to learn about what's going on. It's, it felt very much like I I put on Ariana Grande's album again on Sunday because I needed a break. Mm. I needed I just you know needed to bop to ponytail again, <laughs> and then I felt I felt like a knock at my door, and it was Beyonce <laughs> in her headmaster headmistress outfit. Right. <laughs> and she said, I gave you tyrant. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. The pop quiz is on Tuesday. <laughs> You're recording. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, it doesn't feel arduous um, in that homework way the entire time. But there are definitely tracks. There are definitely moments where you're feeling like. You're feeling the burn. You're feeling like you are really the strain of your brain trying to figure out what she was doing here. And I think a lot of that is also lending it to the fact that we didn't get the full credits mm -hmm. immediately. We didn't, you know, we didn't know things like Stevie Wonder is doing the harmonica on Jolene. It made me have to run that track back, mm -hmm. okay? Because Jolene is not one of my favorites on here. And we'll get to that one. But American Requiem into Blackbird. I love that song. The I love that song in general from the Beatles. I think it's a beautiful song. I love that it has the reference to the Little Rock Dine. And I love I feel like that's obviously why she picked this song. Um it's beautiful. I think it would be amazing if she had didn't done it on tour, if it were this live rendition of Blackbird from Beyonce that you constantly play back. Um at parties or something, or when you're just at home wanting to listen to, you know, Beyonce's great covers. Like I was listening to her cover of um, "Sex on Fire," mm. you know, the other day. Listening to her do Alanis, like that, that that is fun to watch a live rendition of it. For the album, for me, I've been skipping. It's it. also a yes. weird second track, you, you know, after mm -hmm. the the yeah. major quality of Amer American Requiem, going into what I would call basically a conventional cover yeah. of. Blackbird, like mm -hmm. it actually to me sounds like the Sarah McLaughlin cover from I Am Sam a little bit. And I think we do know, we don't know, but we can certainly suspect that that's one of the ones that was added quite late. Yeah. Because that, so Tanner Adele is one of the uh, vocalists on that album. She's a black country girl. She had a song called uh, Buckle Bunny, a single, Buckle Bunny. Amazing song. So I. And she references Beyonce yes, on she it. she does. She calls herself like the, Be she's been calling herself the Beyonce of country for a mm. minute now. And I like, I'll say I like her as a person. I think she's really fun. I like watching her TikToks. I love watching her. Like I was just watching a few clips of her performing in London. She's really fun interacting with the crowd, explaining like American references. Buckle Bunny did not do it for me. Mm. I think Buckle Bunny mm. needed a few more crosses with a with a producer. <laughs> I just I don't like the way it, I don't like the way it sounds. Um, I like the idea of it. I just think it needed something else. But I really like her. And I'm really glad that mm. she's getting this exposure right now because I think she is going to be a very important part of country. And all the voices on this particular cover sound great, by yes. the way. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you need to take one of Cody Rigsby's Peloton classes because it sounds great <laughs> when you're on a Peloton bike. <laughs> <laughs> and I also want to think about the Tanner Adele of it all. My friend Brendan uh, Holder was reminding us in our group chat that we were fully clowning Tanner Adele in February, uh, because she was tweeting out, uh, I really want uh, a Beyonce feature. I want to be on a Beyonce track. And people were responding to her like, maybe you need to work on that craft, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and it was fully like people were making fun of her. And then she was vindicated when she ended up on Cowboy Carter. But from the tweets 
And from how she was referencing still wanting to get on a Beyonce track, I just know that NDA is strong. Mm-hmm. Mm. So that tells me that she was added to this song recently. Yeah. Mm. Yep. That's almost certainly the case. And I'm never going to clown a woman for for tweeting what she wants. That's how I ended up at Shondaland. I DM'd <laughs> that woman. <laughs> and got that said, I am uncomfortable <laughs> with the idea that Beyonce or someone near her is reading Twitter. Just right. d- stay away. D- don't. It's garbage. She, no. Oh, she is so she, active. She knows everything that's going on. When yes. she did that last year when she had that TikTok of her and Jay-Z and was using that viral sound, like, I'm on my way to see mm. My husband. It's like she's she sees everything. And, and, I want to see her burner, and I want to know who she follows. Yes, and if she's not seeing it, Mama Tina is certainly sending those links along, right? Because she sees oh, Mama everything. T- <laughs> she is. T- you need Mama Tina on terminally online, is right? It, okay, because she does not turn oh, her phone off. Ira, Ira. <laughs> I will be passing that along. (laughs) I'm still not over Tina saying uh, that she's had some of these tracks on her phone for years or something. I was like, don't let us peek behind the curtain. We're like, there's a curated show going on, Tina. (laughs) The House of Darion has no windows. You can't tell her anything. (laughs) So after this, we have 16 carriages. Uh, How do we feel about 16 carriages in the context of the album? In the context of the album, exciting. It has that outlaw quality that Mm -hmm. I think permeates the album. Mm -hmm. I do tend to skip the song. It's Same. been with us for a minute. Yeah. Um. I I haven't been skipping it because I love the way it transfer it uh goes into Protector, and I feel like that song for me is kind of the start of a really interesting storytelling run that that I like. Um. I I tend to see Sixteen Carriages does feel like it is a lot about Beyonce's past, but because Protector to me seems like it's more from her mother Tina's perspective. Um, I'm sort of starting to see 16 Carriages as a little bit like that as well. Because with the album probably very likely likely having originally been called B and Say, I think this was a tribute to her mother mm. in the way that Renaissance mm. was a tribute to Uncle Johnny. And so with that in mind, I have started to see a lot of the songs as more from that perspective. Not verbatim, I'm not saying this is life if you read the artist statement that beyonce released um she does fully acknowledge that this is a lot of this is an exaggerated character Mm. i wish people would stop saying that all these songs are about jay-z this is she does not always have to write just from what she knows but um because of that and because of that perspective i 16 carriages has taken on a little bit of a new meaning for me and so i do listen to it because i like the flow i just want to say in general that i find people obsessive about who a female artist is writing about because I feel like it's it's a way to recontextualize a song to be a to just talk about men again. Right. You know, and it's like mm-hmm. like just to stay in a conversation about this, like it's it's the obsession with who your Sovain is about or your you mm-hmm. ought to know is about. It's like you're not talking about what she has written. You're like mythologizing the fact that she is hurt by a man. That's right. it. I mean, even in the Ariana Grande context, right? There were all those memes about how the boy is mine is about Ethan Slater. And it's she talks in Zay- in her Zane Lowe interview about how she just wanted to write a bad girl anthem because her fans love that. And also, she's stolen many a man. So I choose to believe it's about Big Sean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay? But she stole him from Santana. Who, I should say, you got lost in the shuffle. That Tiny Desk concert, excellent. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you know what? That's a big ass desk. Have you ever thought about that? Right, right. I think about my desk, and it's tinier than that desk, which makes me feel so inadequate. And there are so many people in there. How do you get invited to a tiny desk concert? By the way, I don't know, but I think this album should be one. Yes, I, I mm. really, I have never in my life thought that that woman should march herself to DC to do anything like that. This album would be mm-hmm. perfect. That said, they should really do it up like a saloon. And by mm. the way, I did come up with the pun um, saloon Knowles this weekend. Does that speak to anybody? <laughs> I <hate> okay. You. <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> Get the fuck yeah. out of here. Honestly, I was going to say with the getting ahead of myself um, to Act 3, you said that Renaissance is a tribute to Uncle Johnny. This feels like a tribute to her mom. If it's going to be rock music, I definitely feel like Act 3 has to be a tribute to Solange, the sister. Yeah. We get the sister album. Mm-hmm. Cute. Because I feel like all of her rock 
and indie influences have come from Solange. By the way, yeah. a a the Carters like album where it's just a Beyonce Solange duets album. I mean, that would be also fabulous, right? I'll take it. That'd yeah. be sexy as yeah. hell. Okay. Um, Protector. Also a skip for me. Honestly, oh. my amended oh. version of this album it goes from American Requiem into My Rose, <gasps> and I love the I love the sound on My Rose. Mm. I love how she changes her tone on it. Um. And because I love my rose going straight into Smoke Hour uh, with Willie Nelson. And I am a little bit disappointed that Willie Nelson is only on the album in a speaking role as the sort of person on the radio. But I do understand it. And I love the beginning of Smoke Hour where the stations are changing and you're hearing, you know, some um, Rosetta Tharp. You're hearing yes. um, some Chuck Berry. Uh, it's It's definitely a fun um song and it adds to the vibe of the album feeling like it's sort of you know you're listening to a jukebox like you're you're driving around like you're sprawling through mm -hmm. the old west okay first of all i need you to give protector another chance maybe one of my favorite vocals she's ever done mm. i but i listen to that song and mm. cry I, I I find that to just be so beautiful. Um, in terms of the jukebox feeling, like I definitely agree. For me, this album has been one of my dreams has been to do what's billed as the largest yard sale in the country. It starts in Detroit and then it goes like all the way down some highway into the south. And for me, listening to this album is like driving that road and sort of just like having a car where the Bluetooth and the CD player are broken and you are just forced to listen to the radio and you're listening to country stations and the music is changing based on the location that you're in. Maybe like at the top of Levi's mm. jeans, I think you hear a, um, you hear like a cassette being inserted. And so like, maybe that's just a cassette tape that you've picked up at like a local gas station or something where you pulled over. And I think that's what's so beautiful about it. It is like we've said, it's not quite country. It feels Americana, outlawish. And it's just taking you on this journey through what American country music can be. And that's that's just like what I've taken away from it. And by the way, you just mentioned the Chuck Berry and Rosetta Tharp. Of it all. I mean, like name one other artist of any genre who would slam those both into like a song. Mm. I mean, it's just I mean, it's a remarkable mm -hmm. achievement and idea. It's just like like th to put both those people. And also, it's like Rosetta Tharp, still a name people don't know. Like it's again, she's doing the didactic thing, and for the most part, doing it extremely organically. It's just extremely impressive. Yeah, I want to compare it a bit to High Fidelity in a way, just in the sense of Beyonce lately has felt like the really cool chick in the record store who's you know putting you on some game yeah. whenever mm -hmm. you come in. Like you're you're going in because you know like. It's so like me, like I used to go in and pick up a Bee Gees vinyl or something and be like, I really like this. And um, there was a person in the record store who was like, well, have you listened to Andy, their brother? You know, so like that, that is like how I got into Andy Gibb, who I love more than the Beatles. And that's how you became a Sorry. shadow dancer. That is how I, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> that's how I got to Andy Gibb, who I love more than the Bee Gees. Mm. I don't uh, know about that. Thank you. And though. you don't like Andy Gibb? I love Andy Gibb, but then the Bee Gees are the Bee Gees. I think I like Andy Gibb more than the Bee Gees because I am obsessed with Andy Gibb's story. It's a very tragic uh, right. sort yes. of personal story. And I think that like the story of him attaches to me more than and, and the, his lore. Okay, I'm obsessed with his okay, lore. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, it'll make a fine biopic, which I think just got a different director or something once again. <laughs> yes. Um, but then we get into Texas Hold'em. Which also sounds so much better to me in the context. Definitely, of Agree. definitely, Agree. yes. Especially with the the radio y intro that we get from Willie Nelson, which mm -hmm. by the way is a uh, something that I've heard on albums before. There's uh, a Carpenter's album where uh, they inter they they do a section where they do a quick hit of all these old songs from the fifties, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's like that. I, I love that feeling too, just because how often are people even listening to the radio anymore? So just to remind people that it even exists is very nice. And also, you remember I did this math this weekend where now Beyonce and Dolly Parton both have connections to Willie Nelson, which means he's probably the auburn-haired muse of Jolene. That is probably what it is. <laughs> <laughs> He fucking Jay Z. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody Beyonce. needs a redheaded stranger. That's all I know. Beyonce arriving, Beyonce arriving home, sniffing the air. 
Is that marijuana? <laughs> it's not my strand. W- Willie back? <laughs> <laughs> I think that after Texas Hold'em, though, is when we get into the, 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 the album that I want to listen to, okay? That is when the album gets cut, yes. mm-hmm. okay? And that is Bodyguard. Bodyguard I is agree. It's my a favorite. fucking song. Yeah. Yes. It feels, it feels very... Um, feels very tapestry it feels very folk music fleetwood like it feels mac like yeah a it feels class- like christine yes, mcvee it- fleetwood mac to me mm, yeah we it is a classic pop vocal yeah we didn't get album full album credits until about five minutes before we started recording but when i tell you i knew Raphael sadiq was all over that fucking track <laughs> mm-hmm. i could that i don't know if you're not familiar with Raphael sadiq he he's been a fixture in the music industry and he produced uh cuff it off of renaissance as well he has two albums. One of them is called Stone Rolling that he did solo. This sounds like it could be all over Stone Rolling. And so if you like this song, you need to go listen to that whole album, plus the one that he did before. He is genuinely like one of our just musical treasures that everyone should be mm-hmm. incredibly familiar with. Also, go listen to his group from the 90s, Lucy Pearl. I also want to say this song sounds to me a little bit like you know this Jackson Brown song, Somebody's Baby? She Must Be Somebody's Baby. Mm-hmm. It sounds a little bit like that, too. But like that pan 70s um, pop rock vibe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also want to say, if you don't know Raphael Sadiq, listen to Tasty by Khalees. He is all over that album. Oh, yeah. gosh. Um, Mary J. Blige. Uh, like, he he is up there with the face. And then go listen okay? to Tony. Like, he is. Yeah. yeah. Go listen to Tony, Tony, um, Tony. He's fantastic. Um also, another person who worked on this song was Ryan Beatty, who I adore. He worked on three songs on this album. A, um, it's a gay singer, um, songwriter. Not one of Warren and Annette's kids. Before. That's Ella Beatty, who I saw in the play Appropriate this weekend. I'm sorry I'm getting them all confused. <laughs> I could tell the bodyguard had a little sweetness to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that. Uh and he also worked on uh Two Hands to Heaven. He it's the out the songs that feel a little little tender, uh a little um, you know, sexy. Mm. I feel feel like those are definitely things that um feel very Ryan Beatty is. So if you like these songs, you will also probably like his music. Julius is gonna get no rest at these concerts. No rest. <laughs> The girls are going to be all oh. over him. <laughs> <laughs> and now, of course, comes the introduction uh, of Dolly Parton, who, of course, comes right on. I saw somebody on Twitter say it sounds like Jay-Z literally bought her a cameo from Dolly Parton. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but she is never going to like do anything spoken word without any kind of Bruce Valanche style quipping going on. And that's what you get her saying, like. Oh, you had a problem with a girl with hair? Well, I had a problem with a girl with hair, too. Isn't that something? Okay, here comes a song. Like, wow, Dolly is really on brand. The same she has been since, whatever, nine to five before. Hey, Miss Honeybee, it's Dolly P. You know that hussy (laughs) with the good hair you sing about? Hearing her say hussy. Sent me to the moon. Which is Dionne Warwick culture, as you know. (laughs) Yes. Some of your your better accent work there. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my God! Thank the you. The lightest, thank you. I've been working and most damning. I've been working on that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will say though, Jolene is not a hit for me. I would call it a creative writing exercise um, that maybe <laughs> yes. should have stayed in the notebook. I, I think it's. I think much like Blackbird, they're both. They are both great songs because they are great vocals. Mm -hmm. She has produced the hell out of them. I think just in the context of this album, both songs are a lot less exciting because Mm -hmm. we have all of this new music to absorb. And then we're just getting these two songs that we are very familiar with. Yes. And I'll do, she did more with Jolene than she did with Blackbird to like make it her own. And I, again, I like the violence of this album. So that endears to me, but were they not on the album? I wouldn't be like, sad (laughs) also sometimes when like an artist is covering someone they're attempting to put put a twist on the song or uh bring out qualities that maybe the original version doesn't i think the problem here is what she is doing adding like this kind of devastation and um kind of bubbling under hurt it already is in the song i feel like you know i I have a problem with the i'm going to bring them up again carpenters there's a carpenters tribute album called if i were a carpenter where it's like 
grittier version. Sonic Youth's famous cover is on that album. And it's like, these songs were already dark. You didn't have to add a rock vocal mm -hmm. to make it dark. You yeah. know what I mean? So that's sort of my bone to pick with this. Now, what I will say is that it does, again, this storytelling flow flows into Daughter perfectly. Yes. Uh -huh. I, I can't mm -hmm. be mad about that because then you get to Daughter and the perspective completely flips. Mm. True, but I will say that bodyguard into daughter also feels the same. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll be your bodyguard. I also really like how that song, going back to bodyguard, flips the protector role from a woman protecting a man, and then you get into daughter, and she is. This is the daughter is the sequel to Daddy's Lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, you get, like my daddy said, shoot, and when you get to daughter, she's covered in blood. Yeah. <laughs> All right. She's she she's she is she is ditching the weapon and she is running for the police. Uh I love Daughter. Daughter almost feels like it is the sequel to the telephone video. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm looking forward to um we haven't gotten to the song yet, but Two Must Wanted. I hope we get a Miley and Beyonce like Thumb and Louisery going on. That would be nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, lastly, I just want to say about Jolene. I think that what really works for me is that it feels like a black exploitation version of Jolene, as Doreen St. Felix called it uh, in her excellent review mm. of The New Yorker uh, yesterday. But I think that if it, you are getting a black exploitation version of Jolene, I, I think I needed it to go further, to be honest. It's in some respects too faithful to the original like it really i love the acrylic sound you know i love the harmonica which we didn't know stevie wonders playing um sounds great i like the sort of distorted voice in the beginning that's going like joe 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 lee like i like that part but then the rest of it is just jolene like give us the shaft theme or something up in mm. there yeah. you know like give us give us something from truck turner you know, where she's, I love that movie, Michelle Nichols. Uh, give us, some, like, give us Pimp. Give us Superfly. Give us something else that feels like it is really just sort of going over the top. Which she does with Spaghetti. Mm -hmm. That enjoyable. song, by the yes, it's enjoyable. It's weird. A song that starts off with a timestamp. Right. Re just, like, refer mm -hmm. referencing Thanos, a person I have not thought about. I, not upon five years no, at this point. The only person snapping here is me. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the Thanos reference still hits me every time I listen to it because it feels so... Beyonce rarely makes a reference that feels like I'm listening... I'm watching the pop culture that the kids are watching. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and this song you know, starts out with Linda Martell talking about who we should say is the genre. first black woman to sing at the Grand Ole Opry, um, who is mm -hmm. featured on this album and um, has a little ditty to say about genres before we jump into another country song. Mm -hmm. She's still with us, yes. by yeah. the way. Yeah. She is still like alive. Years old, um, yeah. yeah. And so um, she starts talking about how genre is sort of um, constricting and how people get trapped into genres and it doesn't help them really expand as an artist or show you everything that they're capable of. And then we get straight into a sort of um, country hip hop um, anthem, which has a great verse from Beyonce on it. It has a less memorable verse from a man named Shabuzi. You said that damningly. He's, okay. Oh, he's in that. Listen, <laughs> all right. I'm glad. I turn it off after Beyonce's verse. I'm okay? happy for this man. He is a Nigerian American uh, musician, country, sort of like alt country musician out of Virginia. I'm happy for him. I'm glad he's getting his shine. <laughs> he had two songs on this yeah. album. And guess what? Uh, that the second one. That's a bop. <laughs> the second one is a bop. Um, Sweet honey butter. Yes. But this one, the the I really feel like spaghetti is sort of. F flopped for me after Beyonce's okay. verse. And then I'm sort of like, what are we doing with this song here? Um, before we get into Alligator Tears, where you were claiming that Protector is one of her best vocals. I'm sorry, honey, it's Alligator Tears. Alligator I love Tears this song. Is... This is probably my second favorite song on the album. Yes. Yeah. I think yeah. also, um, okay. uh, to me, it actually reminded me again of Fleetwood Mac. Like the guitar reminded me of The Chain, mm -hmm. the suspenseful sort of drama of that song and i will say i think the thing i like most about that song that feeling that that tension is almost something i could have stood to hear more of on the album like a little bit more 
danger sounding, even though we are getting a lot of violence, as you said. Mm -hmm. I definitely felt that Lewis was going to like this song. Uh, I feel like somebody else also said I I knew Bodyguard was going to be your favorite, as if I was a a dick (laughs) for liking it. Well, no, I was, I was, um, I was feeling that you would like Bodyguard and Alligator Tears too, because I just felt like whenever we talk about music on this show, you know, you and I obviously have very different major touchstones on like what we like to listen to but i feel like the touchstones that we agree on you know very much female pop vocals of like the 70s and 80s yes. you know very fleetwood mac yes. heavy you know very funk heavy i feel like bodyguard and alligator tears are very positioned in like our venn diagram of songs that we like. oh and certainly the the vocals on those two songs are so beautiful i i think my friend referred to alligator tears as sort of the all up in your mind of this album in that it's it's sort of going to be very underrated and you're only going to hear a few people talking about how much they love this song but i can't wait till she performs that one it's live. gonna be beautiful i mean this will the alligator tears is a song that will be performed at every i went every wedding that i go to That will be when everyone starts bringing out their violins because I went to Oberlin, so I went to a conservatory. Uh, Mm -hmm. So everyone brings violins to weddings. And I tell you, that's going to be one that people are jamming out to. I feel like we're going to get so many covers of this. Yes. What are your feelings on Just for Fun? I love love that song. Another Ryan Beatty track. Just for Fun is, it's just beautiful. This, you're right, right here, we were sort of in the um, beautiful, sweet part of the album it is it's it starts out very um didactic then it gets violent and then it gets a bit emotional before we start pussy popping as um beyonce is wont to do yes. yep. you know the 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 latter half of the album um once we get to linda martell show it sort of feels like very much in line with renaissance yeah right which makes sense as renaissance was supposed to follow right into this because i do think she was i think originally we were aiming for maybe like a chronological situation where we're starting in that early americana going into dance hall and dance music and then ending felt like we could end with like 70s 80s rock it was is my thought I I yeah, also want to say that I this is the only regard in which I almost wish I had heard this album before Renaissance because I feel like Renaissance created this universe of aliens and um, space travel and we're bouncing between all these planets all the time and it's a constant ride. Whereas this, I feel like you are bouncing around, but it's more like you're going between different patches on a quilt. And I just feel like the the uh, uh, momentum is a little bit lesser on this, whereas Renaissance was confidently going in all directions at all times, whereas I feel like there's a few too many detours on this album. Well, you know, I feel like um, the whole road trip element of this album, you know, it feels like you're on Earth first, and then you get into space. Because mm. you end up at um, Area 51. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Took a wrong turn that, at Albuquerque. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no, yeah. I think that's what the visuals are going to be. Mm. The visuals of just the, you know, long road trip remind me of um, remind me of that canceled television version of Keep It that we had once. Um, that we don't have to bring up. Right. But it was supposed to be a road it's trip It's done, been show. brought up. But yes, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so then we have Two Most Wanted, which has Another wedding the song. Miley Cyrus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Miley Cyrus is on it. The Thelma and Louise of it all. Obviously, the Oh Brother, Where Art Thou elements of it. This is the song that people were predicting would be a Gaga feature um, when we just first saw the title of it. But I think it really works as a Miley song. Their voices sound great together, and I did not expect that. I didn't either, and I think that is probably just a credit to Whoever was engineering that, I, I salute them. And also, a uh, very memorable hook. I just think it's a song you're immediately singing again once you hear it, even one time. Yeah. My first reaction was, Harold, they're lesbians. <laughs> 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 Your lips to God's ears. I yeah. love that. Um, it is very sapphic. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, her and Miley in, in that sort of video would be almost sort of like her prisoner video with Dua Lipa. 
which is one of Miley's sexiest videos. Luckily, she follows this up with something the opposite of sapphic, which is Post Malone yeah. um, on Levi's Jeans, a song I do really like. I, yeah. And I think it's kind of okay, an inspired good. choice. I was going to say, watch your mouth. <laughs> You, is that you your talk. man? Okay. So what I... Uh, yeah. uh, baby, talking about Austin Post, that's my man. <laughs> I love about her featuring Miley and Post Malone back to back is that these are two people who have been, who have taken from black culture uh, at one point mm. in their careers very visibly. And at the time, I think were rightfully ridiculed for it. And now she has taken them back in this reclamation of this genre. She has taken them back and been like, okay, now I'm going to use you. Um, and I'm going to get what I need out of you to to refocus this genre where mm -hmm. it should have been to begin with. And I think that that is very poetic. Exactly. She's the gander yep. here. <laughs> you know, like what was good for the geese. Uh, I really I love how you articulated that because I feel like a lot of people were questioning why she was working with Miley and Post Malone because of their sort of. Um, history involving black music, but I think it makes perfect sense in the thesis of the album and this sort of reclamation yep. moment. And I do want to address the fact that a lot of people are concerned about the reclamation element of the album. It's like, why are you using sort of white rage to fuel your album? And I think that she is absolutely, you know, like not everyone needs to be in this Toni Morrison space of I'm writing my black art and I'm ignoring everything that happens um, involving white people in my life. Because I'm sorry, it is a big moment, the fact that your CMA performance was scrubbed from the internet. You know, if anything, I feel like my main criticism with this album is that, um, and Doreen also pointed this out in her review, it's going to feel dated in its thesis in the sense that she references, you know, the CMAs or something like, I don't need those awards, et cetera. Like, I don't need the Grammys, everything. And it's Jay-Z has rapped about, like, we don't need the Grammys um, before of the Carters. And yet they showed up to the Grammys again just to have their faces played in again. Um, they've referenced, we don't need the Super Bowl. And now Jay-Z is booking acts for the Super Bowl halftime show. It is this weird thing of saying, we don't need this and having all of the, um, you know, sort of like attitude that comes with that only a year or two later to be in the thick of it. That I think that's a fair criticism. I, I was thinking a lot this weekend about just because I I love pettiness. I love uh, that energy that Earth signs do give out being a Capricorn myself. And it is for me, it's very funny now that Jay-Z showed up to the Grammys this year and said what he said, knowing that that woman mm. was sitting on this album. It, it, right. like, mm -hmm. it is a very funny. And whether she wins album of the year or not, I, I am going to look back at that moment and chuckle. <laughs> mm -hmm. My favorite album of all time is Harry's House, so I don't want to contribute to this. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and Adele's 25. Remember him? Two, I bump. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, on the Linda Bartel show, she opens it up with saying, um, "Those petty bitches have nothing on me because I'm a clever girl," which some people think is a reference to "Clever Girl" from Jurassic Park. I would say I not. saw that. I don't think I would so. say not. I saw I saw it on <laughs> Genius.com, and yo, we they were editing Genius. We had vocalists on this album, vocalists <laughs> to the people who were thinking that she had Taylor Swift singing backgrounds on a Raphael Sadiq track. Insanity. Oh. Insanity. Insulting also, to all involved. <laughs> also, you yeah, would hear uh, Taylor Swift, I think. I yeah. mean, I know that. Anyway, it's a weird story. The girls were yeah. editing to, yeah. out of control. <laughs> I would say that, honestly, even in the thesis of Beyonce and Taylor and their friendship, too, you're not going to see Taylor Swift popping up on a Beyonce album because Taylor's fans are insane and rabid. And they, first of all, even created a bodyguard Wikipedia page that immediately vanished once they discovered that it wasn't Taylor on the song. Um, I don't think Beyonce, in all that she's doing, would want to attribute the success of her album to a Taylor no. feature mm -hmm. at all. No. Meanwhile... Taylor is already assured in her dominance of white culture and the mainstream anyway. So Beyonce appearing on a song of hers would be a get for her. She'd be excited for it. You know, it wouldn't have the same sort of cultural effect and it wouldn't mean the same thing. Anyway. 
flamenco is a skit. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yaya yeah, yeah, is sure not. Woo! Oh, God. yeah. For me, Yaya yeah, yeah and Bodyguard are constantly tied for the best for me. Yaya yeah, yeah, for me was the after having seen Renaissance and having and watching old videos of her during the B Day era, um, where she was really just sort of like cutting up mm -hmm. on stage with the Sugar Mamas, her all female band at the time. Yaya, yeah, yeah, even on first listen, was the song where I was imagining her on stage performing this the song's about like five minutes now i'm imagining when we get the live version of yaya -Ya, it is a sort of 12 minute sprawling performance uh, sort of akin to um what she was doing with um get me bodied at um homecoming mm -hmm. i like i just see like a lot of call and response to the audience the band playing on for long her just dancing up a storm on stage this song is a oh, when she when they go from Yaya into Work It Out, I'm gonna mm, lose my goddamn yes. mind. I literally, <laughs> I, even like there's something about the 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 song Yaya where I'm thinking about how she looks in the Work It Out video. Oh yeah, I, you know it's mm. it is Yaya is 100 percent Work It Out Work It Out's like older cool cousin yeah. come back from college. And by the way, again the Beach Boys moment in it where she references Good Vibration, almost puzzling, almost puzzling. Well, no, not puzzling to <laughs> me because again. Not on the CD, not on the vinyl. And I do wonder if Yaya was supposed to be maybe the first or second track on Act 3, the rock album. Yes, right, right, right. Again, yeah, yeah. there's so many rock mm. influences here. You wonder what ends up getting subsumed into this album from the potential third chapter. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the, the Beach Boys just hit me because that is like, that is, a, that's another Venn diagram of my shit. The Beach Boys, Beyonce, and Nancy Sinatra. Come now on. that I expect. Yeah, a little Nancy <laughs> Sinatra on this album. Yeah, Beach Boys, I just want to say my favorite song of theirs. I just wasn't made for these times off Pet Sounds. A plus. Anyway. Um, all right, speed round, moving through the rest of the album. Love Two Hands to Heaven, Love Tyrant. I wish Desert Eagle were a longer full song because to me that has another thing we both love, which is the sound of Rufus and Shaka Khan on it, that like slap bassy Ugh. sound. Mm. And it's like we could have used, I think, a moment of thick funk that was sustained on this album if we're going to be traveling mm. through the 1970s anyway. Yeah. I will say my one thought about Tyrant, the violin has not hit that hard since Miri Benari was still on tracks. <laughs> I mm. I thought I was listening to John Legend's first album. I was like back in like, again, not to invoke him, but like first Kanye stuff. Oh, right. That violin, it beautiful. <laughs> Desert Eagle for me is just, as soon as the beat drops on that song, I wanted more of yes. it. And I was mm -hmm. so upset that it feels like an interlude. Um, I appreciate Riverdance. I enjoy more it. More than I love it's, it. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's fine. Yeah. I like the beat. But Two Hands to Heaven, Tyrant. Dolly Parton um, appearing again on Tyrant, um, sing, doing her little ditty. Yep. Uh, and then Beyonce just getting um, black as hell. A little hood on the rest of the song is so funny to me and sweet honey buckin is another one that just feels like i mean it's giving pure honey from the last yeah, yeah, yeah. totally so, yeah. Uh, what, you know, it's it's just giving you so much i really feel like the back half of this album is so vibrant and if renaissance had come after it would go it'd go straight into i'm that girl yeah. Mm, yes yeah also, Church Girl could have been on this album. Def yeah. Oh, my God, of course. Well, that, and yeah. so that's the one thing that this album is like maybe missing is more gospel influence. That's like, and that's the only, like, that's the one little thing that could have been thrown in there. Yeah. If she's going to hit all these constellations of musical genres like this, like, why not just include it? But you're right. Yeah. But again, these all are technically part of one act, these three albums. So maybe she did, uh, as part of this one project, do that. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um, I would say letter grade for this. Yeah. Uh, for me, if Renaissance for me is an A, I would put this album at a B. Plus. Exactly what I would say. Mm -hmm. I for me, this is this is easily this is an A A minus for me. It as a as a woman who got her start in pop culture, writing about how I didn't understand why the show Supernatural in all of its creation of Americana and like its reference to folklore and the West, why that show eliminated black people and like why there was no touching on black and brown Americana folklore, why we weren't involved in that. Like this validates so many of my interests. And I just like, I feel like this album was written mm -hmm. for me, for the girl 
who wears a gun trigger around her neck for the girl who has a Jesse James memorabilia collection for the horse girls. Like this, this is my Beyonce album. This is it. Exactly. I feel like this album is going to grow with me over time, but it really feels like, yeah, the Beach Boys of it all, the funk of it all, the Rufus, Shaka, it just feels like it touches on, like I said earlier, that that kid who would go to the record store, who would be shifting through the vinyls, who would pick something out based on the cover or the recommendation of the person who works there. This is her in her high fidelity record store, cool chick mode, and she's just obviously she did this for black people in a sense and but i think that you know talking about the reclamation of stuff is just sort of another way to box it in and i feel like this album goes to great lengths to tell her to tell you not to box her in and i feel like this is just for this is a bitch who loves music okay and this album is for people who love music and love the weirdness of America and pop culture and this country and all the shit that it represents. It has an amazing and, sense of time and place. And mm -hmm. within that, it's a sense of where we've been and where we're going to go and where I've been in terms of location and where I'm going to go. So I just feel like it's like a, it's a, a crossroads, if you will. We're at the Delta again. Look at me. I'm a musicology professor. <laughs> <laughs> so now of course I it had work to reference... in Oberlin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so of course it had to reference the Marvel Cinematic Universe because that is where we are. <laughs> <That's exactly. laughs> Our guest today is always one of the best parts of anything he's in. You know him from his Aww. affable charm in the Jurassic World movies, Detective Pikachu, Dungeons and Dragons, Generation, and his new movie, The American Society of Magical Negroes. You can see him next in A24's upcoming and apparently frigging amazing. I saw the TV glow out May 3rd. We are delighted to welcome to keep it the dynamic and captivating Justice Smith. And you're Hello. in studio. Yes, I'm here. I don't mm. like speaking over a screen. I like talking. Well, I mean, not to call I you mean, out, Ira. I'm, I'm offending you now. I'm jealous. <laughs> no, I'm jealous. I, was, I was literally in L.A. last week in studio with Lewis, a first in years. I should have come in um, there. Yeah, I should have come in then. Yeah, but I want to say I... This movie that you're in, the American Society of Magical Negroes, what I love about you is you've always had such this great just sort of candor about you as an actor, which I feel like a lot of people don't have or try and shy away from. And I feel like you, even on your Instagram, you have embraced the fact that people have a lot of thoughts about this movie. <laughs> uh, they had a lot of thoughts from the trailer, and now they've had a lot of thoughts now that it is out. How do you, I guess, deal with the conversation surrounding a movie like this um and did you anticipate that it was going to be this hot a topic while you were making it not as hot as as it is um i i knew that there was going to be i knew it was controversial to an extent i didn't know that the the initial concept like the the like base concept was going to be so hard for people to uh like grasp like this like like, uh, first off, explaining what a magical Negro was, explaining that trope to everybody was, like, a chore within itself. And then kind of introducing this metaphor for, like, the ways black people have to navigate white society. Uh, again, I thought we all had an understanding, like, yeah, the code switching is real. Like, this is just kind of like a funny metaphor for that. But that really, like, shook people up. And then on top of that, there's, like, the interracial love story. There's, like, my casting. Which I, those I was like more prepared for in terms of controversy. But I will say I've been on like a really long spiritual journey with this movie because it was one that I had so, like such a big hand in. Like I loved so much and I felt like was my story. And like, you know, I, I had always wanted to do a movie about race because I, I'm black and <laughs> race is a big part of my life. And, but like a lot of the scripts I would be saying, I'm like, okay, well, this isn't my specific experience. So I can't, I don't feel like I can lend myself to this. But with American society, I was like, I get this. I, I grew up in a very white environment. Like I, I compromised myself in so many different ways. I grew up in Orange County, California. Oof. Vance. Mm. Ew. Yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> the guttural <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> reaction. Yes. You know what I mean? I have driven through it. Yes. I have driven through it. Yeah. So, so. It's not the OC. No. No, 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 no. Not at all. No. Um, so, but like, I got, so I got that. I was like, I, I feel like I could lend myself to this character. Um, and then having such a strong reaction 
from Twitter was like, okay, that's fine. From like Fox News or Breitbart, I was like, if anything, that's great press. Like, I love that. But then like Black Twitter, like that really kind of bummed me out because I was like, damn, like, I, I like, I do it like, I, I don't know. I just you know, you never want to upset the people that you love, and. Um, and then, but I was like, okay, but when the movie comes out and they see it, they're going to love it even more. But then like critics bashed it. Like no one went to go see it. I mean, like the people who did loved it, but a lot of that Twitter backlash kind of fucked us. Can I swear? You sure can. Yeah. Uh, please it do. Fucked You're actually us not in the enough. fucking ass. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I really had like a, like a, like I was at a fork in the road where I was like, how can I respond to this? I want to respond to it with humor, you know, even though there was like the initial pain. Um, and also it taught me so much about like uh, self-reliance, not self-reliance, what's the word I'm looking for? Like knowing who I am, knowing what I'm fighting for, and knowing who I am as an artist. Um, and like, so like when people were saying things online or whatever, just like being like, that's okay. You guys can you guys can have your opinions. That's completely fine and valid. And some of your opinions are valid. And I don't have to defend myself necessarily. If and you said also that you've had an entire journey when it comes to doing press for movies in general, like liking the process of doing press or like finding a way to find joy in promoting things when yeah. conversations can end up as you just said all over the internet or strange or whatever. How have you made talking about movies, something you enjoy doing more? Um, I find that, okay, so my metaphor, that I, my analogy that I always use is um, people who work with animals don't like scooping up shit, but they scoop up shit so that they can continue to do what they love. And press for me is the scooping up of shit of acting. You hear that, Ira? <laughs> <laughs> and every Fuck time I say that in an interview, <laughs> every time I say that in an interview, the person that I'm speaking to is like, uh, I don't know how to take that. I don't yeah. know how to receive that. <laughs> um, but I actually, you know, that's kind of how I got into like, just being like, okay, let me, you know, suck it up and do this. But now I kind of, I, I kind of like it because I... <laughs> I don't know. I like I like talking to people. I like meeting new people, I, and I and I try not to like I try to have fun with it. I I don't know. I don't really know how to answer that question because it's not it's just something that I kind of worked on doing having fun. Yeah, I worked on having fun in in press situations, and so it just started coming more naturally you know what i have to say though is like in a way you feel to me like a rad critic like in another life you could be somebody who's just like talking about movies as opposed to starring in them did you ever have any ambitions to be that kind of commentator no really well i definitely think that critics <laughs> okay i don't want to oh, here goes. Be, i'm loving I it be i'm loving what intention. i say yeah <laughs> let it out put it in the book <laughs> i just <laughs> Oh God! Um, I I just I feel like I personally feel like critics, people who <laughs> they should have like at least some hand or some experience in like filmmaking or like you know the industry to like some extent because I feel like this like objective like I just love movies and so that that gives me like I have a right to a voice the right to opinion. I feel like it's just it creates a jaded individual when you don't know how much effort goes into like making a film, getting a film made. Mm -hmm. Not to say like we should get brownie points because we made a thing, but I, I just feel like it would provide a different perspective. This is all to say that like if I were to ever become a, a reviewer, I think I would have m more ethics, yeah. <laughs> more of an ethical, a little standing. more restraint. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then like more credibility i guess because i i know what it means to make a film can i tell you something though as somebody who's never made a movie in his life it is so much fun to opine about them and not know a fucking thing <laughs> i have to say <laughs> to just be you make blowing television. it out my face yeah i but feel you, like you know, you know what goes into the process oh i mean like i've seen a camera before etc but yeah i also think <laughs> yeah but you know in that same vein listen i have a lot of contradicting opinions in that same vein, I think that like good art doesn't show you. You don't see the work. 
Like you shouldn't mm-hmm. see, you know, like the equations on the side of the paper. You should just like see the answer, mm-hmm. you know. So I feel like if audiences are watching your thing and it's not connecting them, and then you want to like, but I put so much work work in it. I think that's bullshit. I think you know that's not. It's like again, it's like you don't get brownie points for effort. You know, I but again, feel... those are contradicting. I mean, I'm enjoying you working that out though. Yeah, <laughs> equations, if you will. <laughs> Yeah, it's if you're we're so far removed, I guess, from um, film. You know, even even if you make films, even if you make television, you, you are not actually there on set. So like, you're, there's still sort of this removal from the process. Uh, but you've done theater, uh, and you've done. Um, and would love to talk about that. You did this play, The Mother, with Isabel Huppert, Whoa. icon. Yeah. But for me, as a person who has worked in theater. Um, the brownie points thing, you, no matter how hard you know people are working, like I can go see I Hate It Moulin Rouge on Broadway, you know, and you go and see it and you can see the sweat on these dancers. Yeah. You know how hard they're fucking working. But then you can also still leave it and say, I hated that and yeah. why it was, you know, it made. And so there is always this disconnect between that. But how do you feel about? The theatrical process, I guess, then, as opposed to the film process. Pros and cons on on either side. I think my like theater is like a. It, it always has it has like a very special place in my heart. Theater because I I grew up doing theater, like like when I was studying acting, it was like to be in theater. It wasn't necessarily like film acting, so I learned everything I n- know from theater and and there's and it's also the actor's medium you know they say film is the director's medium tv is the writer's medium and and but with theater it's like once that curtain goes up i'm completely in control yeah I, you know i i have my notes i have my script but like the audience's experience is completely shepherded by me and and that makes me feel the most autonomous as an actor because i, I you know I, I like i put work into this thing you know and into like this craft of being an actor and i and i have lots of like I, <laughs> i'm trying not to like uh uh i'm trying to be humble but i have like like I, I have like i have good ideas you know like when it comes to my performances and and when it comes to film and tv you know it's really left in the hands of like the like the director like if the director has a strong vision and how they're going to edit your performance or you know where the like in television where they want to like the writers want to take your character over the the season, so you have less control. And um, I'm not f- like faulting the film and television experience because I, I I I love it for its own reasons. Um, you know, theater you have to hammer out the same story every single night for months on end, and film and TV you can just like you just have to get it once, and then you, it's like in the can. But I mean, yeah, those are the kind of like the pros and pros and cons but yeah, i love theater i always want to return to theater and we were just talking about theater oh yes because we both saw appropriate, appropriate starring uh, sarah paulson who by the way is just fully laurie metcalf now like you remember sarah paulson <laughs> that's gone it's laurie metcalf and, and in scream too yeah uh, I, I totally yeah I, I i agree with that um she's incredible in that she's awesome in the play. i love that playwright too that brandon play. jacob jenkins he, yes. he's incredible uh, i i don't know if you saw the comeuppance did you see that? Do you see that? No, I saw the Octoroon. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't see the Octoroon. I want to work yeah, with him Octoroon. so bad. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the awesome thing about that play is it sort of at the beginning feels like a string of theatrical cliches like a God of Carnage or Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf where people are having arguments that, where they say things like, and you're making it all about yourself again. And then you realize <laughs> it's more of this secret zone of interest type movie where it's about what they're not discussing and something that's happening mm-hmm. alongside the play that is very interesting and recontextualizes these boring arguments they're yes. having. It's a very, very good play. Yes, it's so good. It's also like the first play. I mean, maybe there's a, I guess zone of interest is kind of in that same vein where it's like, it's a play about race that only like features white people. Yes. Which I, I thought was like, I, it, like it's an art piece within itself because even watching the play, like like with like a predominantly white audience, like the things that the white people were laughing at and the things that like me and my partner were laughing at were like completely different things. Like the things that gagged us were like, oh shit, like that's terrible. And the white people were like, oh, we're so kooky. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I feel like this is a commentary in itself. Yes, totally. You know, like so it's it was just like, beautiful all around. But we must say we've now brought up 
Sarah Paulson, but to get back to Isabel Huppert, finally. Mm-hmm. Um, when she was here on this podcast, we were like intimidated initially. Wait, we you guys know, had her on? Uh, d- excuse yeah. me, we sure did a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, and we she's were. This is a place for icons. Yeah. Okay. She's incredible. So, welcome. We were, we were scared initially. <laughs> and you, then guys. it turns out, if you know what you're talking about, she like loves you. And then, mm. but her vibe was, you know, she's not method at all. She's very instinctive and then seemingly just does the job when she's on a movie, movie set. What is it like working with her, who I maybe has done the most acting of any human being over the past 50 years. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, She is, she has this thing when we were doing press for Mother, she talked about, she's like, I don't play characters, I play states of being. She said the same thing to us. Oh my, I stole that from her. Because I was like, (laughs) I so connect with that. It's like, it's not like like a mountain that I'm climbing to like create a character. It's like, it's something that I'm mining from within myself. And, and, like, she does that so effortlessly where she's just, like, she hops in and hops out. She also, like, I speak French, and so she would, like, give me little notes in French. Like, she'd be, like, get out of my light. Like, you're standing, like, just move a little bit to the side. <laughs> so, like, the director wouldn't know that she was, like, directing me. But Fuck yeah. I also, like, like got so good at French, like, speaking with her. But I, I really felt she's just, like, so, I mean, such an incredible artist and also, like, really maternal and I don't know if that's just because of the roles that we were playing because I was playing her son but she has like this real like like she loves young actors like she's like there to support young actors and just and it's just so bold and like the choices that she makes and it's it's like like when she plays a role it like she does it you're like is that <laughs> like I've never seen a human express emotion in that way but it like makes so much sense to me like you saw piano uh piano oh my teacher? god yes like the when she's, at, I mean that expression on her face. I was like, I would have never thought to like, if I were stabbing myself, like that's kind of what would come out of my body. But like to her, it's just like the way she feels is so unique. She's like having her own human experience. No, she like the way she like, her <laughs> spectrum is like she has this like stony hauteur, and then suddenly the bizarre will occur. Yes. And yet they both feel organic to each other. Exactly. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. just you worded it better than I ever could. But <laughs> she's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I love her dearly. You know, I want to ask a bit about you you talked about seeing um the play with your partner and being shocked about it. Um I want to ask about sort of performance in general you talked about with American society about not wanting to upset the people you love not accepting like black Twitter or something do you sometimes feel like even your own self when you're not acting has to be a bit of a performing to I guess what your audience is I'm asking this in particular because I feel like you know when you were dating um your partner at first there's a lot of um just post online about you in general, about the fact that oh, you yeah, had that. Yeah. a black partner, about the fact that you know you were representing black love in general. A oh, that's what they were saying. It. Yes, there was a lot. Of I wish I saw that. It. You didn't see any of those. I didn't there's see this any whole, of that. Wow, there's this whole thread um, from writer Mikkel Street about both of you, about how like it was a shrine to your black love. There's a whole article in Extra Magazine about it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Did you ever? Well, you didn't see any of that. I was about to ask if you felt like that was something that you felt you needed to present to the world as a black queer actor. Uh, That article, if I think it's the right article, that one I did see where he talks about like like how much uh, like us being public meant to him, like because he Mm -hmm. had never seen like uh, like public like a black queer couple that was like public in that way or or something. I, I don't know. Um, but that was beautiful. Yeah, I, I saw that one. But like a lot of like the social media stuff. I, I'm not really on social media that often. Mm-hmm. Like, and when I am, I just feel like terrible about myself because it's not good for my mental health. But um, that's a whole re- other path I can go down. D- the question was, <laughs> do I feel <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Do you do you ever feel like that's a bit? Uh, do you ever feel like you know? that's part of a performance too like how you have to present yourself to the world yeah to an extent yes it's it's a difficult thing to navigate because uh i mean being a public figure to any extent is not really natural you know like you're you're like exposed to the public in these like short bursts where you kind of have to like show your 
multitudes like within like like these like 30 second sound bites or you know like or even like in a podcast like it's like you guys get this however long this is what is this an hour how, how long are we doing this i wish it we got it down to an hour it's routinely longer but yes okay <laughs> <laughs> but but you know what i mean it's like uh, we, they get this and then like the public metabolizes it and, and they make their opinions about who you are as a person based off of these like short bursts of you but they don't see like the ins about and outs of you daily and so it's kind of like this difficult thing where you're like i understand how important it is, how like important publicity is especially to my career because like uh like the more relatable i seem the more it helps me like literally helps me get jobs you know because it builds my profile which makes me more marketable or more like lucrative to like studios or whatever so it's like it's kind of this like it's kind of like the scooping of shit of like how do i <laughs> how do i really like find a way to present myself authentically in the public eye in these kind of in, in these like limited moments um that like like allow me to have some privacy and some integrity but also allow people like in to my life um so that they can connect to my like art even more you know what i mean like it's like a it's a really difficult thing to balance I, I wouldn't say that i have all the answers right now but like i just try to like live in the moment and try to like be as authentic as possible and um i think the whole like inviting people into my relationship was like the base level like thing like base level of authenticity i could offer the public because like and we can really get into oh child I'm, there's so many things i'm not saying because i'm really trying to answer your questions but like we can really get into like the way that like you know the public uh like digests queerness you know and or like when a when a when a an actor or a singer or a celebrity quote-unquote celebrity like uh comes out it's just like it becomes like such a brand and I'm mm -hmm. like, like queerness is like, at least in my life, it's so normal. Like, it's like, that is like not how I brand the people in my life. It's like, oh yeah, they're queer. And like, that's like the main kind of like talking point about them. It's like, no, they have all of these other, you know, things about like, like, I don't know, but maybe then that's just because I'm surrounded by so many queer people in my personal life. But it's just interesting that that becomes like such a, like a moniker for like celebrities. But I have that many queer people in my life, but I do, when I say hi to them, address them as queer initially. <laughs> so, so it's like a little about. Um, I, I feel like it's slowly changing. I, I know, sorry, I don't no, know. Go ahead. I feel like it's slowly changing as more people come out, you know? Um, uh, and I, I hate that fucking, the whole coming out thing. But anyways, but I, I, I feel like it's slightly changing. It's becoming more normal. There's like more roles for like queer actors, which is really cool. And like queer actors are playing straight roles, which is really cool. Um, and so it's, and also, like, I, I feel like a lot of the reaction of, like, oh, this person is out, like, this person is queer, is, like, from queer community being, like, oh, I feel safe now, or, like, I'm, like, more interested in, like, this, this actor or this singer or whatever, because, like, I see myself in them more, I relate to them more, and that I like, it's, like, you know, that is kind of, like, a cool connective tissue between audiences and and public figures. I think the last stone to be unturned in this regard is when we get a Stanley Tucci biopic, it should be a gay actor. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> then we will have made yes. it. Yeah. Yeah. Finally. Absolutely. No, okay, before we let you go, I have to ask about um That's I, it? No, we're not done yet. I have to ask oh. about I saw the TV glow. Okay. Because the reviews coming out of Sundance for this were so extreme. Yeah. My friend Richard Lawson, who is the most cynical man alive, I say this lovingly, who writes for Vanity <laughs> Fair, it was his favorite of the whole festival. What is wow. it like to get that kind of attention and were you expecting it? Um, yeah, that film is incredible. When I read that script, I was like, I have no idea what the fuck I just read and I have to do this movie because it was just incredibly unique and, and singular and and I, I don't know if you saw um we're all going to the world's fair yes mm. but mm -hmm. like it, it jane has this way of creating films that like get under your skin where you're like i'm not this girl online doing all this fucked up shit but like i am in a way i am her you know that it is my my teen experience i, I don't know like it's like this weird like jane creates feelings like i, I just like really fucking dark creepy crawly feelings and I, and I think I saw the TV glow is 
like in that same vein of just like getting under people's skin and even if they don't understand it logically like what's happening they like feel it viscerally there's so many people who i talked to after sundance who saw the movie where i was like oh did you like the part where this and this and this happened and they're like oh that's what that meant (laughs) but like who were like telling me they loved it and like it was incredible and so i'm like asking what they loved about it and they're just like it's like the it's like a vibe you know and i can only hope for more danielle deadweiler in my life too she's phenomenal another amazing she's like an abnormal talent talent. she's an abnormal talent Mm -hmm. she's an amazing actor i like I, i mean she's Obviously, she's she's blowing up, but like I can't wait for like her really to like hit the stratosphere because she's she's incredible and she's also her personality is phenomenal. Like it's again, I just love really. I mean, this is gonna sound like shade, but she's kind of off. Like she's kind of like just like askew. Like and, and like I love people like that because she's just like you talk to her and it's just like she lives in her own world and I think that's why she's such an incredible artist just like Isabel Bear. it's like the way she like feels feelings is so unique and like that's why you're like captivated by her and she's like always doing something different on screen but. no it's like if I ever like were eye to eye with Mary Louise Parker I know I would see something off <laughs> you know what I mean you want that in like a genius actor right you know? right right yeah. very true yeah you should have saw the seagull okay she's, she's staring right at you Ugh. Uh, was she Justice. in the seagull? Say what? She, she, yeah. There was a adaptation of the seagull um, that was done, uh, starring her uh, and Hari Neff um, and some other people. Whoa! I, want, I wanted to see that. It's a film or it's a. It was no. It, it was, was, um, was off Broadway. Off Broadway. It was oh, off Broadway. Yeah, I wish I saw yeah. That. It was great. That it was. So um, it was a modern adaptation of it. Um, That's but sick. it was really, really good. And uh, thank you for being here. I mean, I, I, yeah. I really do have to commend you. I mean, you know, you t- the. I love the shoveling shit metaphor, and I feel like I get that from you, especially because you have been so likable in so many blockbuster movies that I really enjoy, though. But, I mean, for a young actor, you when you think about the movies you've been in, you know, Jurassic World, Detective Pikachu, I mean, like, you have done the brunt of, I am promoting a movie, I am at Junkets, <laughs> this is constantly my day. So I yeah. get it. Yeah. Um, but no, were... it's I don't mean to, like, shade... I feel like I like subtly shaded both of you guys like throughout this thing when I was like. Imagine not subtly shading us. I mean, I'm, yes, of course. Also, <laughs> but don't I, worry about being humble here. You are. I know you were born August 9th. We are three Leos on a yeah. podcast. This is yes. August Wait, Wait, you guys are right. Leos? Duh. <gasps> yeah. Oh, you couldn't tell no. immediately. You must not be like a Leo. <laughs> Wait, okay, but then I like, feel extra bad. Like, I really wasn't trying to shade you. Cause, because I said, no, I literally please. said, I'm like, oh my God, press is shoveling, shoveling shit. I said, <laughs> like, if you've never worked on a set, like, you can't, like, have opinions about movies and TV and stuff like that. I, have, you, have you guys worked on sets before? I'm a writer for I, Jimmy Kimmel Live in the Academy Awards. Okay. Nothing else, though. Okay, so yeah, you have I'm credibility. So that, so that one isn't shady at all. Yeah. So that one no, you didn't no, receive right. as shit. Just people who are outside the room suck. Yes, we agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But and, also, and we, again, we're not I regular have pre- uh, paradoxical feelings. We're not regular feelings. press. Okay, 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 okay. I love you blushing. I saw the actor glow. Look at him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I didn't shade you guys. Okay. I, I, okay. Especially, you know, you're, no, you're you, Leo, so sensitive egos, right? Uh, right, no. Us yeah, Madonnas. I just, yes, I don't, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. anyways. Artists, we're sensitive about our shit. Yeah, we're very sensitive. Uh, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank I wish you for you, we sorry it's not longer. I know, I was just you getting know? into it. <laughs> Likewise. Dan- <laughs> Daniel Brooks told us the same thing. She was like, I got more shit to say. Yeah. I have <laughs> way more shit to say, but so you gotta come back next time uh, for your yeah. next project. Well, you'll be co hosting the episode next time. Love so we'll that. have the whole whole time. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> and we are back with our favorite segment of the episode. It is Keep It Lewis. Yes. What you got to say? What's uh, what's on your mind? So much. As you know, I'm burdened by these thoughts I carry, but I bring them to keep it. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I saw TikTok again, and you know that means oh. we're already in, at a, uh, an intellectual deficit. But <laughs> somebody on TikTok um, made the comment, am I the only person who's ever noticed? First of all, stop right there, because no. Stop pretending you're the first person to notice. Stop. Am I the only person who's ever noticed that SNL has never hired a, like, hot woman? Okay, I mean, first of all, what is the point of that TikTok? You want people in your face arguing that somebody is hot? Because, by the way, that's what people fucking did. So now there's like a list of screenshots being like, can't you see she's hot or whatever? Lorraine Newman, what a sexy woman. This is not helping um, this situation. We're not arguing for anything other than saying there's validity to being dismissive over 
very talented people because they don't look a certain way. I don't know. It's like, and I think this is like this, the person who posted this happens to be a woman of color. So it feels more like valid cultural criticism than what it is, which is a load of shit that nobody needs to interact with. Um, (laughs) But I just want to say, are people under the impression that like, SNL is full of like extremely hot men or something like what is the point of posting this I just found it to be a, an extremely kind of toxic idea that people thought they could respond to and turn it into um, some beneficial thing for all of us but I just found it to be mean and that's it being mean is not a point of view or pardon me it is you know, a point of view just not one I want to hear sorry I haven't thought about my own point of view yet <laughs> you know it's giving rage bait yeah, you know, it's giving. Right, yeah, yeah. I, wa- I want you to get mad. I want you to respond. I want the TikTok views. It's very much the same way that there's always a wayward Gen Z gay tweeting something about how uh, open relationships suck. We fought for equality just to get into open relationships. Or the one I saw yesterday that said uh, from the same person who has tweeted this before too. Um, I can't believe gays make out in public. That's so gross. Like it's giving IRL grinder. Excuse me. I can't go to a baseball game without seeing straight people make out, which um, (laughs) I'm just going to say nothing really erotic about that sport for me. Mm. I also want to point out that the entire premise of, first of all, sitting down to make that TikTok is, is loser behavior. Even if it is for rage bait, I cannot get past the point of you look, you look stupid. Yeah. (laughs) I, I get it. So, like, so it's like, am I going to come to your the rest of your content? Right. Also, I, I just also am, am I the only one who's noticed? What does that mean? Like you said on the Wikipedia, went through the like photo file of every SNL star, and you said zero percent hot. <laughs> also, you know, I don't. You know, I don't really want to qualify it with a, a actual response, and you know, get into the debating of you know whether or not there's been hot women on SNL no, and it the was, hotness of them. It was annoying but to see Tina like, Fey trending because of this. Right. Yes. But like everyone is ignoring the hottest woman who is currently on SNL right now and it's Colin Jost. <laughs> no, that is a lady. Yes. <laughs> Let's talk about posture. <laughs> His porcelain good looks. Yes, yes, yes. I wrote, what is your keep it this week? My keep it goes to Maybe myself and the finally, rest of the internet. thank God, my life, my <laughs> prayers. Yes, go ahead. Myself and the rest of the internet for making me think that the Gag City World Tour was going to be abominable, but I saw Nicki Minaj on Saturday night at Madison Square Garden, and she killed. Really. She was so fucking good, and the show was fantastic. The I know that the it seems like the show was thrown together very quickly, um, which which can happen, you know. I mean, I don't know if she was planning to really do a big, massive tour in uh, this um, sort of manner, but man, I was impressed, and, I, and I'm a concert goer. Like I've seen so many. Um, random pop stars concerts um that are giving less of what nikki is giving here and i think that what's really great about this is fans have been starved for it you know she's mostly been doing rolling loud and other sort of festivals for years and not really giving the barbs um me like a tour and so i remember the nikki hendrix tour which was supposed to happen and um that got canceled. Um, I wore to the concert um, my Nicki Hendrix sweater that I bought um, when that concert was initially canceled because I was like, well, let me get this merch because it is going to be valuable uh, in the future. And, and not like I'd ever sell it, but it's nice to wear and it's nice to see people recognize what it is when I'm wearing it. Um, finally getting to see Nicki live yeah. was just amazing. And the energy of everyone in the room Whatever you think of the Barb's online, <laughs> there's a lot to say about them. Well, that is where the they people, live. Yeah, the people in the concert was a mix of younger fans, gays I knew in the city, um, older people. To be honest, like old, like older people who just sort of like love her music and love hip hop, and everyone was singing along to every song even if some people didn't know the newer songs they knew sort of like songs from five years ago 
Um, everyone was singing along to like the Pink Friday songs, like the Roman Reloaded songs, the Pink Print songs. It was just really an amalgamation of a lot of people from different cultures, races, um, I feel ages. Like, I feel like a, uh, uh, a criticism people have had of her live is she's holding the mic up to the audience too much. Yes. And that is, I mean, listen, it can happen. You know, she will be, she will be rapping and then she'll be like, uh, you know, first things first. I, <laughs> and I'm a keep, <laughs> but <laughs> she was doing a bit less of that than you. I was seeing on TikTok of the earlier shows. So maybe she's taken some of that criticism, but I also think it's, Makes sense for her to do that because the audience was truly rapping along to every word. They screamed to Nicki Minaj songs. Yes, they they ruined their voice rapping along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it felt completely communal. I was on the floor of Madison Square Garden and people were standing in their chairs so they could just see it better. It was it was such a fun communal experience, and if that could be everyone's sort of um, experience of the Barb's, (laughs) I think that the the view of the fan base would be um, better off. Yeah, I have to. I have to agree. I will prioritize that in the future. I think it's good to know that Gag City has some infrastructure now. You know what? Ga- Customs was a breeze at Gag City. <laughs> 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 and that's why I have global entry. Okay. Oh, I see. Just for that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I have global entry. Uh, my global entry appointment was when I arrived in Gag City. You know, just five minutes oh. and. Wow. Quick photo, yeah, et cetera. <laughs> Quick gag. All right. Thank you to Justice Smith um, for being here this week. Thank you to Kendra James also for hopping on with us to talk Beyonce. I mean, how could we not let Kendra in the studio? She was coming in the studio either way. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> she had a lasso in hand. <laughs> ripping open the door with it. <laughs> she was giving Denzel Washington, I'm leaving here with something. <laughs> <laughs>